What is your name, please? My name is Joe Savoldi. The story of Three Oaks' greatest ever athlete was remarkable enough to land him on a nationwide TV game show. So will the real Joe Savoldi please stand up. He also landed in newspaper headlines, in newsreels, and even behind enemy lines in World War II. Carefully, they search for... But Joe Savoldi's story begins in Italy in tragedy. He was born in Castano Primo near Milan, 1908. His parents had lived in Three Oaks, running a sweet shop for 16 years. But his mother Celeste had rushed to Italy after learning her father had been stabbed in a robbery. Giuseppe Savoldi was born prematurely on March 5th hours before his grandfather died of his wounds. Weight at birth, less than four pounds. Fearing her tiny preemie wouldn't survive an ocean voyage, Celeste Savoldi left baby Giuseppe in Italy with her widowed mother. She returned five years later with Giuseppe's younger brother and sister, but her eldest came down with whooping cough and once again could not make the voyage to America. Because of World War I, it wasn't until 1920 the Three Oaks Acorn reported Celeste Savoldi's return from Italy with all three of her children. Twelve-year-old Giuseppe became Joe in Three Oaks, working several jobs while attending school. He later described his embarrassment at having to start in first grade, but Joe picked up English quickly enough to graduate at 19, even delivering the graduation oration, though he had a few rough patches academically. They had geometry books, and uh, Joe got up and decided to toss his out the window. Tom Volman heard the story from his mom, Christine Donner, another member of the class of 27. Uh, the principal was right there outside the, uh, the classroom door and saw what happened and tossed Joe out the, down the stairs. <laughs> that would have taken some doing. Joe was by then an astounding physical specimen, a record-setting shot putter and sprinter on the track team. The center, at 5'11-190", on basketball teams that contended for state titles, and he played baseball to boot. But Joe's speed and power were most evident on the football field. I believe the year was 1927. Jim Jeske's dad often talked of his ill-fated attempt, playing for St. Joe, at tackling Joe Savoldi. So he was went to tackle him around the knees or below, and he said, the next thing I know, I was on the sideline, and they were giving me smelling salts. I want you to go out there and give everything you have. Legendary Notre Dame coach Newt Rockney heard of the powerhouse runner playing just 25 miles away and brought Savoldi to South Bend. As a sophomore, Joe played little and poorly. Rockney had to talk him out of quitting. Some suggested Joe had trouble picking up the coach's complex systems. The next fall, the student paper barely mentioned Savoldi in its 1929 season preview, terming him a reserve. But Rockney told a sports writer, if that kid can remember one third of what I'm going to tell him, he's going to be the greatest fullback in America. He bolstered Savoldi's confidence, and in week three of the season, it paid off. Soldier Field, Chicago, against Wisconsin. Savoldi scored two of Notre Dame's three touchdowns on runs of 71 and 40 yards in a 19 to nothing win. Wrote one sports writer, Savoldi was the whole works last Saturday, and let there be no doubts about the matter. A star was born. The old bald eagle of football uncovers another one, trumpeted this cartoon of Savoldi, who also scored with writers, dispensing catchy post-game quotes. That was nothing at all. Watch me go through Carnegie Tech the same way. Pitt Stadium was packed for the Carnegie Tech game, the atmosphere intense. Yeah, yeah. After a scoreless first half, Rockney, on a stretcher with potentially life-threatening phlebitis, gave a rousing halftime speech. And then early in the second half, with Notre Dame inside the 10-yard line, Rockney called Savoli's number four straight times, and on fourth down, he catapulted through the air, yards off the ground, and tallied a hard-won touchdown. The nickname Jumping Joe was born, and the Savoldi legend grew. His strength attributed to his hard scrabble upbringing, particularly his work carrying bricks as a teen. They would pile bricks on his arms, and he would go up the ladder, you know, with the two loads of bricks, you know. Joe had worked with his uncle John, a stonemason in Sawyer, now widely quoted in dialect about his nephew's muscles and hod carrying prowess. No man except a Joe can carry brick as fast as I let him. And a Joe, he carried them too fast. Joe, one stronger boy, I tell you. Quarterback Frank Caradeo and Savoldi became Notre Dame's first Italian-American stars, and the Irish backfield was being compared to the legendary Four Horsemen. 
The 29 team was known as the Ramblers because they played all road games while Notre Dame's on-campus stadium was being built. Notre Dame squad streams on the field as the crowd in Soldiers Field roars a welcome. The closest game against Southern California was tied at the half. Rockney made another emotional locker room oration. You go on out there and play them off their feet in the first five minutes. And a few minutes later, jumping Joe Savoli leapt again to victory. It's over. Notre Dame wins 13 to 12. After USC came Northwestern, two more touchdowns for Savoli. A win over Army capped off an undefeated season and a national championship for Notre Dame. Joe Savoldi had emerged from nowhere to become the team's second leading scorer. The Notre Dame yearbook called him a colorful crowd pleaser, adding his is the spectacular game. Within a week of the last game, Three Oaks threw a huge banquet to honor Savoldi. News accounts say the whole town turned out. And Savoldi was spectacular as the 1930 season opened in the new Notre Dame Stadium against Southern Methodist. He fumbled a kickoff, but then recovered and returned it for a 98-yard touchdown. And a week later, Notre Dame dedicates its new stadium. And all 55,000 seats were filled, and Joe Savoldi shone in the spotlight of the dedication game. All going to Marty Brill, who hands off to jumping Joe Savoldi. He averaged 11 yards a carry and scored three of Notre Dame's four touchdowns. This 23-yard run, a five-yard TD, and this 48-yard. The lead sentence in the papers. The first hero in the lore of Notre Dame $750,000 stadium is none less than the renowned hod carrier from Three Oaks, Michigan, Galloping Joe Savoldi. The Irish dominated their 1930 opponents, with Savoldi scoring frequently and often in spectacular ways. His life story still a sports writer's favorite. This glowing profile called him a smooth-spoken fellow who seems to be quite normal. But with Notre Dame 5-0 heading into a game against Pennsylvania, normalcy and good times were about to end. Notre Dame overwhelmed Penn, Savoldi scoring a touchdown. But on-field achievement was soon eclipsed by reports he'd been married secretly to a South Bend girl and was now seeking a divorce. A local judge had spilled the beans. Joe denied it at first. When forced to admit the marriage, he claimed he hadn't seen his wife since the wedding and that he would seek an annulment. Both marriage outside the church and divorce were against Notre Dame's rules, and Rockney made it clear Joe had to go, though he wrote him a personal check for $1,500 saying, I don't want you to go home broke. I want you to take that money and start a business and do something worthwhile with your life. I don't want you to be a hero today and a bum tomorrow. Joe went pro, first flirting with the Green Bay Packers. Though when the Chicago Bears objected, saying league rules barred signing a player before his college class graduated, Green Bay owner Curly Lambeau backed off, only to see Chicago swoop in days later and sign Savoldi, the Bears paying a $1,000 fine for violating league rules. Savoldi played only three games as a pro and then in an all-star game in Los Angeles where he scored all three of his team's touchdowns and was named MVP, and began meeting with L.A. agents and ad men about parlaying his athletic fame into something more. Man, that South Bend bunch has a team. His Notre Dame teammates had gone on to win a second straight national championship, with Savoldi their second leading scorer despite missing the season's last four games. He averaged a whopping 11 yards a carry. AP named him a second-team All-American. But Savoldi was moving on to a new sport. Come on, they're headlocking, Joe. Way over now. Carry him over there. Newsreel cameras show him training on Santa Monica Beach on, to become a wrestler. Promoters Ed Strangler Lewis and Billy Sandow had seen Savoldi at the All Star game and told him he'd get a bigger payday in his first match than for a whole season with the Bears. I intend to put in as much effort in this game as, as I have in football. Writers came to the Savoldi compound. The family had moved from Three Oaks to California and found Joe downright cordial with a winning personality that makes you feel at home immediately. Joe married a Southern California woman, Daisy DeWitt. There were rumored movie deals and predictions of greatness in the wrestling ring. Savoldi has big arms, big legs, big neck, big reputation. He was big enough so that his admirers would say, how can anybody beat a man like that? I owe uh, my physical development to uh, my dearest friend, Coach Rockney of Notre Dame. But while Savoldi was working on his wrestling and celebrity status in California, Coach Rockney was killed in a plane crash. Back in South Bend, Joe's teammates served as pallbearers in March 1931. For decades, Savoldi would call Rockney, the man who'd forced him to leave Notre Dame, his idol. 
Savoldi was an instant hit in the ring. Not a polished wrestler, but a good draw. Good-looking, renowned from football, a special favorite of Italian-American fans, and, as famed sports writer Damon Runyon put it, As a wrestler, he's one of the best showmen in the game, with plenty of color and personality. Savoldi developed a flamboyant signature move, the flying dropkick, aimed at an opponent's throat. Against wrestling's rules, technically, but Savoldi was such a star, rules were changed or left unenforced. Some columnists decry the dropkick as a sign wrestling had changed from athletic contest to spectacle. One complaining, Slugging a guy with a blackjack should be considered a perfectly legitimate bit of business. But Joe's fame grew so great, a simple visit to Three Oaks in 1932 landed his photo with those of Jack Dempsey and Babe Ruth under the title, Their Names Make Today's Sports News. His second marriage broke up after just 14 months, Daisy claiming she only knew where he was by reading the sports pages. Within weeks, he would marry again. Lois Poole would remain his wife for more than four decades. In 1933, Joseph Oldie also got a title shot. The champ, Jim Londos, likes of Oldie, a handsome, well-muscled immigrant, heavily favored in their match in Chicago in April. But Jumping Joe was declared the winner, a shocking result, immediately called into question. In the match's 25th minute, Londos had clamped his legs onto Savoldi's elbow in a Japanese jackknife hold. Savoldi stood up, holding Londos, whose shoulders touched the mat, and then, as Time Magazine described it, Without waiting to count, referee Bob Manigoff, one-time professional wrestler, tapped Savoldi's shoulder and awarded him the match to the intense surprise of both contestants and a crowd of 7,000. A Philadelphia writer said the result raised a stench that rivaled the Canal of Chicago. There was an investigation. Illinois suspended wrestling matches for a time. Wrestling historian Tim Hornbaker says the upshot was... A tainted referee counted to three on Londos in an arranged double cross. Savoldi, almost without doubt, was in on it. Days later, he signed with a new promoter with referee Manigoff as part of the deal. Much of the wrestling world refused to recognize Savoldi as champ despite his insistence that the match was on the up-and-up. Savoldi's title claim was celebrated by Italian Premier Benito Mussolini, who'd invited Joe to stage a football exhibition in Italy just a couple of months earlier. Savoldi lost his claim to the title within months, defeated by Jim Browning. But the Londo's double-cross did not hurt Savoldi's marketability. He wrestled 69 matches in 1933, 70 matches the next year, and 89 matches in 35. The fellow with the beard, that's Man Mountain Dean, and the little active fella is Joe Savoldi of football fame. They're going to fight, kick, cuff, and moan for the best two out of three falls at Olympic Auditorium. Sometimes Savoldi won with the drop kick. At it again, Joe counts with one of his famous. Another and out goes Dean. Sometimes his signature move backfired. Joe's trying to repeat, look out, wow, just like a ton of bricks. This Italian newsreel shows Savoldi drop kicking an opponent out of the ring and, after being disqualified, slugging the referee. As 1937 began, Savoldi took his act and his family, which now included son Joe III, overseas to Australia, where the Melbourne papers described his matches as clever, sensational, and hilarious. He wrestled in Australia and New Zealand for better than a year, writing a friend, I am not making much money. But we're having a lot of fun. Noto campione di lotta, Italo-Americano, Savoldi, si allena coscienza. Then on to Europe, wrestling in France and Italy, living in Paris for a time. The Savoldis returned aboard the cruise ship Rex in the spring of 38 and were soon enjoying a new lakefront home in Harvard, built by family members including his stonemason uncle John. Through the next two decades, they'd live here, sometimes entertaining neighbors like the poet Carl Sandburg. The home, which still features giant stone fireplaces built by John Savoldi, was later owned by famed movie critic Roger Ebert. Joe went back on the road, wrestling. The physical toll mounted, and some accounts indicated he wasn't making top dollar anymore. But he was still famous enough to be featured in a nationwide ad campaign in which he used wrestling moves to try, without success of course, to wrinkle a Wembley necktie. Savoldi branched out, distributing Ohio-brewed Red Top beer out of a Bridgman warehouse. He sold medicinal wine, said to help with hay fever. And he launched Jumpin' Joe Savoldi's root beer, billed as the drink for all Americans. Wartime rationing eventually torpedoed the root beer business, Savoldi losing a sizable investment. 
The war also led Joseph Oli to a major decision to join the new Office of Strategic Services, a forerunner of the CIA. Motivated by patriotism and perhaps annoyance that Mussolini withheld wrestling purses he'd won in Italy, Savoldi was among the first recruits of the fledgling agency and underwent training at a secret spy camp in the Maryland mountains in 1943. In this phase of the instruction period, the student is taught the gentle art of murder. Savoldi given an ID in the name of Giuseppe De Leo. Joe's fluency in Italian, knowledge of Italy, and physical power made him perfect for Operation McGregor. The man who picked him for it, Michael Burke, described their first meeting. He was built like a gorilla and moved as lightly as a leopard. His wrestler's face had been mashed against the ring canvas a thousand times. I thought he would be perfect. He would terrify Gerosi and maybe the entire Italian fleet. Gerosi was Marcello Gerosi, a New York businessman Savoldi was assigned to bodyguard. The aim of McGregor was to put Girosi in touch with his brother Massimo, a top Italian admiral, and persuade Admiral Girosi to turn Italian naval assets over to the Allies in the wake of the ousting of fascist dictator Mussolini in July of 43. Marcello Girosi had written a carefully worded appeal to his brother, the admiral. This letter is written with the consent of high authority of my country of adoption. I would not have undertaken the writing of this letter at all had I sensed even in the remotest way that Your Honor as a man and as a great soldier would be questioned or suspected. I am willing and ready to meet you anywhere you may select. The McGregor team made its way to Sicily as Allied troops landed there in September 43. Rolling seas made Savoldi's stomach not too tranquil, according to OSS records. Then to Salerno where the McGregor team was under constant mortar and 88mm shell fire, and a German patrol machine-gunned the streets. The Italian Navy eventually surrendered through channels other than the Gerosi connection. Meanwhile, a news story about Savoldi's whereabouts slipped by military censors, but otherwise, Lois Savoldi got only cryptic letters saying Joe was well or in fine spirits. $400 checks arrived monthly at the Savoldi home in Harbert. Joe was among OSS agents who salvaged Italian torpedo equipment and made sure that experts who'd created it got back to the U.S. to help the Allies improve torpedo technology. Records say he was particularly good at training Italians for military police work and secret missions. In June of 44, news accounts had Savoldi working as a detective for the military police, busting up racketeering and black market commerce. Articles even quoted Joe as saying he might get into police work after the war, though six months later, when he left the OSS, Savoldi asked what he should say about his undercover activities, adding, I am going back to public life, wrestling, and I'm sure the newspapers will ask a million questions. Joe gave, as instructed, only vague answers about his wartime exploits, though when OSS records became public, reporters wrote glowingly of his service. His OSS superiors rated him excellent, his physical skills superior, and concluded, He performed his difficult and dangerous duties in a most commendable manner. He returned to the ring, complaining wrestling had grown too theatrical, but Joe's own histrionics were wild as ever. This 1946 match against Gorgeous George loaded with vintage wrestling theatrics. Flopping, exaggerated stomping with the opponent quavering in mock terror. The match ending, as often happened, with an errant dropkick leading to a pin. But then, more melodrama as Savoldi left the ring. Leading the referee to help Jumping Joe get revenge with some hammed up mayhem. Joe often played a somewhat cartoonish villain in post-war days, and the papers noted an ever-worsening physical toll. After almost 14 years of wrestling, he has a collection of mended tibia and fibula, callous clavicles, knitted knees, and watered elbows that would outfit several football teams. Joe sought less stressful work. In this telegram, he urged Three Oaks businessman Charles Warren to pursue some hot business deal, signing off, love and kisses, jumping Joe Savoldi. Savoldi became a wrestling promoter in Chicago and Michiana, staging matches in Bridgman, at Silver Beach in St. Joe, and at the Benton Harbor Armory. A wrestler named Houston Harris began appearing at Savoldi's wrestling shows, described as a colored giant. Savoldi trained Harris, a Benton Harbor steel worker who would go on, renamed Bobo Brazil,
to win several world championships, becoming wrestling's first African-American star. Joe Savoli of Immortal Notre Dame fame, they say, got Bobo interested in wrestling. Joe did sports commentary on Benton Harbor's WHFB radio. You can hear the Three Oaks High Gymnasium ring with cries of, Come on, Hellinger, toss one in the bucket. In 1953, Savoldi worked security at Malleable Industry, a Benton Harbor foundry plagued by strikes. Workers were afraid to cross the picket line. And Arden Pridgen worked at Malleable then. He was there just to let people know that they had security while they were entering and leaving the plant. Though Savoldi had left the wrestling ring, his son Joe, a standout track runner, was now the athlete in the family. He was still intimidating, addressing the picketers outside the malleable plant. Yeah, he said, I, I don't think I'll take all of you on at once, but I'll take any three of you on at once if you want to give me a challenge. Nobody challenged him, I don't think. But after a scuffle outside the plant was broken up by police, a union leader was arrested and a local congressman, Claire Hoffman, held hearings on the strife, summoning Joe Savoldi as a witness. Joe decried what he called gangsterism on the picket lines, offering little new information, but as the papers noted, a bit of color to the proceedings, quotable as always. There was Nazism, fascism, and there was communism. There is only one thing worth fighting and dying for, and that's Americanism. And let's keep it that way. But Savoldi seldom made headlines now. Living in Harvard, he became a regular at afternoon card games at Schwark's Tavern in Three Oaks. Jovial guy. All, you know, a lot of fun, laughing all the time. Jim Schwartz calls Savoldi a regular Joe, rarely dwelling on his past exploits. Afternoons playing euchre challenged Joe's dexterity. His hands were crippled up from arthritis and, and all the wrestling and everything. And he'd have to hold the cards in his hands like this. Uh, what name did you use as a pro wrestler at that time? Jumping Joe Savoldi. By 1958, Savoldi's national profile was so low, game show panelists didn't recognize him and knew little of his story. Please stand up. <laughs> he fooled two of four panelists after feigning ignorance at questions to which he surely knew the answers. Number two, it says here that you played football under Newt Rockney. Uh, do you know his wife's name? Mrs. Rockney. <laughs> By 58, Joe had found yet another line of work. Joe, what do you do now? I'm in the insurance business in South Bend, Indiana. I represent the Federal Life Insurance Company of Chicago. A few years later, Joe and Lois moved to her hometown, Henderson, Kentucky. He went back to college, getting his degree in 1962 at age 54, then spent 11 years teaching high school science in Henderson. A faculty colleague, Tommy Tate, says he loved it, that he rarely talked with students about his extraordinary life but sometimes expressed disappointment they knew so little about him. His health declined, arthritis curled his fingers, and emphysema left him short of breath. Fellow teacher Tate says only one thing would rile his easygoing friend Joe, any insinuation that wrestling was fake. Tate says he'd preach about it. In his mind, it was real. Savoldi retired from teaching in 1973, that year's yearbook dedicated to him, his plaque in the school lobby. The end soon came. His friend Tommy Tate says death was peaceful, that Savoldi fell asleep in a rocker and just didn't wake up. The extraordinary body that led Joe Savoldi to athletic triumph and worldwide adventure gave out quietly on January 25, 1974.